It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. We were born in and we speak with that spirit of faith. The seed of that thing was planted in 1961. It took root during the Second Vatican Council and it continues to grow and flourish today as our diocese and our parishes respond to the call of Christ and the continuing inspiration of His Spirit of Faith. Welcome to the six-part Catholic Life television documentary which celebrates the 50th anniversary of the Diocese of Baton Rouge. We invite you to learn more about our local church from its historical origins dating back to the late 1600s to its formal inception in July 1961 with the signing of the official papal decree to its current golden jubilee of 2011. Ours is a story of meager beginnings exciting evolution, and monumental growth. It is a story of divine grace and human inspiration. Quintessentially, it is a story of the dynamic interaction of a faithful, provident God with his responsive, tenacious, resilient people and community, which we proudly and gratefully call church. The 1970s were a time of paradox. A generational gap was evident as the contrast between the conservative government and the younger generation grew. During this time, rights for women, minorities, and the disabled were expanded. Disillusionment with tradition grew as well, as did concern for the environment. This was a time when Earth seemed smaller as space exploration gave a new perspective. It was a time of controversy across America as the Vietnam War continued to drag on and the anti-war movement gained momentum. It was a time of exploring man's alienation from spirituality, a time when nothing was sacred from the satirists at Saturday Night Live or the living room of Archie Bunker. It was a time of technological innovation with the invention of floppy disks, VCRs, and Atari games, of jumbo jets, hot pants, and mood rings. With Bishop Tracy's resignation in 1974, diocesan administration returned to a more traditional approach to the church. It was a time of reining in what some described as the more radical changes of the 60s. This swing of the pendulum in what was perceived by many to be a backwards direction proved to be quite controversial. When Bishop Tracy retired, Bishop Sullivan was sent as the next bishop of Baton Rouge. Most people will remember there were big differences between Bishop Tracy's outlook uh, on church and, and involvement of the people and Bishop Sullivan's. Bishop Sullivan established, you know, certain ways of doing things in the diocese, but you, you did have a lot of people that felt strongly about continuing the process of encouraging lay participation. This didn't seem to be a big priority of Bishop Sullivan to have a laity that was really in charge and with a new vision. The next bishop to, to come to the diocese was Bishop Joseph Sullivan. And during those eight years, uh, they were eight years to the day as it turned out, that uh, Bishop Sullivan uh, served until his death. Uh, he was known for his being a strong advocate of Catholic schooling and Catholic education. 
he was very strong on, on the teachings of the church and being orthodox and faithful to those teachings. And he uh, was a national leader in the pro-life movement at the time. During his time, he established five further new parishes from the 17 that were previously established by Bishop Tracy. And I did know um, Bishop Sullivan. As it turned out, I was appointed to the Board of Trustees of St. Ben and Notre Dame. And we would have committee meetings and Bishop Sullivan was made uh, the bishop to head the Committee on Finances. So I can remember several times coming to Baton Rouge for a committee meeting with regard to prepare for the Board of Trustees meeting on the finances of the seminaries. And um, what stands out, and I remember uh, very clearly, is in the several such meetings that we had, and I would say there were at least three, there might have been four, uh, maybe even five. But as we started each meeting, Bishop Sullivan began the meeting uh, after the prayer by thanking Bishop Tracy for the great facility of the Catholic Life Center and saying that we have this wonderful facility because of the vision and the work of Bishop Tracy. And I thought that was very magnanimous of Bishop Sullivan. In the early 1970s, Joseph Vincent Sullivan, who was the auxiliary bishop of Kansas City, Missouri, was appointed as bishop of the Diocese of Baton Rouge, the second bishop. Bishop Sullivan changed the diocese to some degree. He, um, I think, was a little bit more centered on the institutional church than the church as the people of God. And he was also, I believe, a little bit more centralized in his thinking. While Bishop Tracy was centralized and took charge of the diocese, he made sure that the diocesan departments reached out a great deal and did a great deal for the local parishes, provided basic services. I think that Bishop Sullivan, in a way, had the centralization here at the diocese, and it was less of a reaching out. And so the growth that took place took place mostly outside of the diocesan structure. A lot was initiated in parishes. A lot of the young priests were uh, assigned to rural parishes. Rural parishes that had seen a number of priests and pastors who had been there for years. And they brought sort of a new life or a new blood into these parishes. They brought new enthusiasm into the parishes. Parishes began collaborative work. For example, there were about five or six parishes uh, that got together and developed a whole series of talks, reflections, uh, formation, homily hints, prayers, for a Lenten season. Now this was before Renew. This was before any national program came out. The local people wrote. Uh, the priest, the pastors, the associate pastors, the staff, the sisters, some of the lay staff that may have been hired by that time, um, put this whole program together. Then made it available to anyone in the diocese that wanted it. And it was an excellent, excellent program. One of, the, one of the things that never would have been able to have been accomplished by just one parish. Bishop Sullivan viewed the role of the laity and the need for increased parish staff differently from Bishop Tracy, and change resulted. There were certain uh, areas in the, in the diocese that had begun to grow very much as a result of Vatican II. The area of religious education, particularly of adults as well as, as, as young people, many lay people and nuns got degrees 
in religious education. There grew a great expectation of um, change in the laity and uh, uh, their, their concept of their role in the church uh, was, was greatly uh, determined by uh, several moves that were made right after the Second Vatican Council. When Bishop Sullivan came, he felt somewhat uneasy with a lot of this participation, if you will. Gradually, he downsized the Office of Religious Education, and he, um, he also slowed down and somewhat down, downsized uh, the Office of now Catholic Charities. Bishop Sullivan was a, um, a, a rather brusque individual. He was, he was very good on a personal one-on-one -on -one basis, but he tended to be autocratic and, um, and sometimes aggressively so when it came to outside social issues. So there occurred in this diocese a um, a liberal versus conservative kind of split. Um, he was looked upon as being very conservative, where Bishop Tracy had been uh, doctrinal but tended to be more liberal. He was effective in expanding the educational system in the diocese. That was one big thing he had in mind, and he successfully achieved that. Catholic Charities had its beginning in the early 1970s under Bishop Tracy, working with the needy in the city of Baton Rouge. Initially, there were three groups working toward this purpose. The Catholic Family Life Bureau, Catholic Social Services, and the Office of Social Responsibility. In 1974, a more holistic organization was created when the three were merged into the Catholic Community Life Office which became Catholic Community Services and, later, Catholic Charities. As time went on and needs changed, the Consolidated Catholic Charities Organization was able to respond to the emerging struggle of various world populations, which, in turn, affected the people of the Diocese of Baton Rouge. Mostly the work that went on in those beginning days were focused primarily in the Baton Rouge area. However, there was some outreach into the rural areas. It wasn't until 1972 when Bishop Tracy promulgated a commission and they really recommended that those three entities become one and that's what we know today. They were originally called the Catholic Community Social Services and then that changed into Catholic Community Services a few years later and today we're known as Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Baton Rouge. Our outreach is really to all of the parishes of the Diocese of Baton Rouge and um, within the church parishes as well. If we look at the evolution of Catholic Charities and how we've really changed to respond to social needs, you can look in the history books. For instance, in 1974 with the fall of Vietnam, Catholic Charities began relocating refugees from Vietnam who were fleeing their homeland from persecution. Their lives were literally in danger. They arrived here with the clothes on their back, no English skills. We helped them to find jobs, housing, get their children enrolled in school so that they be could become new American citizens. In 1975, when Vietnam fell to communism, there was a great exodus of a lot of Vietnamese, especially from the South. And uh, my family was part of that exodus. It was a long journey. It took us almost four months to get to the U.S. Our family was one of the ten families sponsored by three parishes in Baton Rouge, St. Anthony, Sacred Heart, and the Cathedral. So we were housed at the old rectory at St. Anthony Church for a little while. Um, ten families in the rectory, so you can imagine how crowded that, uh, that was. If you look in the history books and, and see a, a, a country where there's been war or famine, chances are we relocated uh, families from those areas like Bosnia, like Cuba, 
Today it's Burma is one of our primary countries as well as Eritrea and Afghanistan. And that work really has its roots in the Catholic faith in welcoming the stranger. What Catholic Charities did very well at that time was that once we were here, then in a sense Catholic Charities uh, kind of stepped back and allowed the parishioners of those three parishes that sponsored those ten families to step in and help. Um, Catholic Charities kind of provided resources and uh, assistance in terms of knowing where to go to get what. But uh, a lot of the assistance to, uh, f to us came from parishioners. Uh, they kind of took us under their wing. They took us to apply for food stamp, for assistance, whatever it might be. That was a good way of doing it, uh, rather than the agency feeling that it had to do everything. The director was Father Fred Kemmer, a Jesuit who came into the diocese um, to work in the parish of uh, Immaculate Conception in Scotlandville and uh, to work with uh, the homeless and poor in that area. And Bishop Tracy called him into the directorship of this diocesan um, ministry. As Catholic Community Services, under the direction of Father Fred Kammer and then following Fred Kammer, uh, Miss Deborah Rowe, who was the assistant to Father Fred Kammer for a long time, um, one of the uh, major points was counseling parents with, uh, with difficulties, difficulties in marriage, counseling to um, troubled children, uh, family life, uh, counseling in maternity, single parents, trying to further adoptions and work for, for that, caring for the elderly um, and, and offering to provide services for the elderly and helping the elderly find jobs, um, reaching out to the homeless, uh, joining the St. Vincent de Paul Society in working with the poor and the homeless, going to the individual parishes and offering these services on a diocesan level and making the parishes aware that these services were available, um, getting federal grants to provide for um, people who could not work or provide for people with disabilities, uh, it grew. Social services broached new areas as society changed and people openly discussed issues which had previously been taboo. The church began to adapt and respond to those changes. New programs were developed as creative priests and lay people reached out in various ways. My own little contribution, perhaps, to social services began in uh, early 1970s when I was part of the uh, staff at Christ the King. The Claritians were running the center, but I was a diocesan priest who was assigned there and developed what was called Crossroads Social Apostolate. Uh, we put together a board and opened a little house in the South Downs area with the concept that it could be uh, kind of a non-threatening, non-churchy place where people could talk about life issues and spiritual issues on various levels. And that existed through some donors and grants for a couple of years um, where we did a number of bits of programming in an interfaith way and brought together some reflections on life and spirituality. Bishop Sullivan appointed heads of the various diocesan departments and proceeded to run diocesan business in his own style. New programs like RCIA were created and promulgated. Lay people answered the call to holiness as understood in their baptismal promises. As the uh, diocesan director of liturgy, I replaced Bishop Ott when he went to New Orleans a lot of the parishes we had already the um, formation of leadership in apostolic work 
and I was involved with that in my own parish besides in the diocese. We were used to having baptism every Sunday, one-on-one -on -one instruction for adults, and maybe some parishes had group instructions uh, in uh, confraternity classes, but mostly it was a one-on-one -on -one instruction. So some of us were giving instructions to 10 lay people at the time. So the booklet on that, which is still the guidelines for the RCIA, Right of Christian Initiation for Adults, is the uh, blueprint that we would go by. And it took on tremendously. The bishop uh, directed us to have that in every parish, which the priest welcomed. And we got the lay people to assist us in that because you had people lay people who were by this time well instructed in a religion and their catechism. And so the RCIA process would guide them along the way through the year. As a result, the parishes began to have their own formation in the rite of Christian initiation. Oh, it changed from being one-on-one -on -one to now having a group process suggesting that they meet every week, and which they did. And I think in the first uh, year after we developed this, there were hundreds of people who were received in the right of election and the right of Christian initiation. People were encouraged by it. It became the regular process in the parish that uh, worked uh, wonderfully. I was blessed to, when I moved back to the diocese after being away for a long time, even though I grew up in Baton Rouge, moved back in 1973, of being a member of St. Thomas More Parish. And Monsignor Green, William Green, was so open to lay leadership and not the least bit threatened by it but so open to the gifts of the people. It made St. Thomas More for me the most wonderful nursery for my vocation as a priest because our talents were so respected and called upon and used and celebrated. So I thank him for asking me one day, well, when are we gonna get you to be a priest? Call by name personally for me. But I also thank him for the example he gave me of a parish that participates and joyfully uses talents. There was much work to be done. As the population of Baton Rouge and its surrounding areas increased, so did the workload of administering the parishes. Opportunities for lay participation developed and steadily increased. This was a blessing which was not fully realized until a future time. The diocese grew in faith formation and in education of lay ministers. Under Bishop Tracy, and to some extent under uh, Bishop Sullivan, but particularly under Bishop Ott, the staffs of our, our parishes, you know, grew so, so much. And the reason for that really came from the grass roots. Bishop Sullivan stopped sort of the work of the Office of Religious Education, which had begun these adult education classes right after Vatican II and had continued them. A few of the pastors in Baton Rouge got together and said, we, we really need the laity and we want the laity active on our parish staffs, but to, to be active they need theological education. And so they began the um, Religious Studies Institute, uh, you know, here in the Diocese of Baton Rouge, and began to offer courses for uh, college credit um, through Loyola and through St. Joseph's Abbey, um, St. Joseph's Seminary, really, for the laity. And that's why, you know, we today have well over a hundred master de degree level lay teachers in our parishes.
After a short break, we'll see how opportunities for lay participation increased as our diocesan population grew. Roots of Faith, the history of the Diocese of Baton Rouge, written by Lee Loomis and Rene Richard, former archivists of the Diocese of Baton Rouge and original hosts of Roots of Faith. This beautiful coffee table book explores the history of the Catholic faith communities in the Baton Rouge area from the 1700s to the present day diocese. With more than 150 pages of history, early photographs of area churches and present day Catholic life, you'll discover the rich heritage and culture, not only of the diocese, but the individual unique parishes that contribute to its fabric. To reserve your copy of Roots of Faith, the history of the Diocese of Baton Rouge, please contact your parish church to obtain more information on how to place an order. education became a very big program in a lot of parishes and we always depended upon volunteers um, volunteers who may have had no more education than say eight years of Catholic school and and also family as parents but who did a great job of teaching um, the children outside of the Catholic schools and you'd also have to have a parish director of religious education and what we found was that more formation was needed. And since the formation was not really coming out of the diocese, um, the, the, the office of formation was there and provided materials. Some local parishes, three parishes here in Baton Rouge, began looking at the idea of establishing a college accredited formation program especially for religious edu educators. And the Religious Studies Institute began towards the end of Bishop Sullivan's administration and had to take on uh, new roles, uh, contributed to the growth of the diocese during the administration of Bishop Sullivan. And I would say that he was directly responsible for that. Another focus was on stewardship not only of finance, but also of time and prayer. The person who comes to mind for me in terms of the development of stewardship in the diocese is Father Pat Mascarella. Father Mascarella was pastor, I believe, of De Immaculate Conception in Denham Springs. When he was one of the key people, if not the leader, in developing a total program of stewardship for the parish. And that's the way I find things best develop in the church. A model develops that works, and then others are attracted to emulate that model and maybe even develop it over time. Well, he did that. He did a very excellent job of that. Uh, stewardship of not only treasure, but prayer and ministry. So that it wasn't a fundraising effort. I think he gave it the heart of not being just a fundraising effort but a manner of true spiritual development in the midst of which the church would realize all the resources it needs to carry on its mission, whether it be in a parish or at the diocesan level. That, I don't think, occurred until the 1970s sometime. And, but little by little, it did develop. Uh, of course, the initial attractiveness is always, well, your funds go up, your income goes up, your revenue goes up. But if that's all you go after, it doesn't go up nearly as much as if we see stewardship for what it is. And that is a true means of spiritual development through which all the people of the church, including clergy, take fuller responsibility of all aspects of the development of the church, buy in a lot more to the whole mission, and then you're more likely just out of uh, a sense, not of obligation, but a sense of ownership to support the church both in terms of monies and other human resources. The reforms of Vatican II continue to be implemented. In liturgy, early translations from Latin to English were welcomed, though these changes were not without some challenges. 
I think after the council, uh, particularly in the in the seventies, um, the church received the first um, editions of the texts that we were using, and so it was a first attempt at translations because we were now working out of the vernacular more, meaning um, the. Uh, that both the priest and the assembly were given the opportunity to pray the prayers and to hear the scriptures in their own native language. One of the biggest changes in Vatican II was how suddenly it came to some and some who thought that Mass had never changed for the whole history of the church were amazed that the Eucharist would change. Of course, historically that's not the case. It's always changed and evolved. But all of a sudden it began to open up participation we could put down the uh, missalettes that had the Latin on one side and the English on the other. You actually didn't need the bells rung during the Eucharistic prayer anymore because that was only to catch you up on the place where you were supposed to be in your missalette. I can remember times when in, uh, as a boy people would start saying the rosary when Mass started and that was what you did and didn't pay attention to Mass. I can remember that communion started around the holy, holy, holy and so it had no relationship to the sacrifice that was going on in the Mass. So all of a sudden we began to learn more about the beauty of the liturgy and particularly the beauty of the Eucharist and how it was supposed to be the center. So all of a sudden we're participating and of course there were all the growing pains of experimenting with this and this was kind of silly. I can remember the first time that I went to Mass in English and they said, you who take away the sins of the world. But if you say you who, it sounds funny. So it took a while to get used to the translations. But once it did, people started to get into the Eucharist and what it really meant. They could hear the beauty of the liturgy. And I think it uh, opened up a wonderful participation. And all of a sudden, it, it makes a difference. This was a time, I think, of both organic development because the church is very clear that organic development is, is how we develop. We go to our roots and we stick as close to our roots as we can when there is change coming, um, particularly liturgically. Um, there was also a development in those first years, the first 10 years in the, in the 70s of, of a musical um, repertoire. Now some of it was not good. We had a hymnody tradition we didn't have a singing assembly tradition, at least not in our country. So I think there was a, an attempt to start getting a repertoire of music together. Uh, there was certainly a lot of work done to introduce the assemblies of the church into praying the prayers, saying the prayers out loud, learning the gestures. Uh, so it was a time of renewal, ref, uh, ferment. Was there some experimentation going on? Certainly there was. But there was also a great deal of fidelity where priest and assembly were seeking to understand what these renewal reforms meant. And so for me to say, was there some experimentation going on? There was, but it was limited. And I think it was a minor contribution. What was truly going on is again, the church was dealing in the culture that it lived in the world and was trying to get its liturgical house in a direction that was organically developing from our tradition with the best of scholarship and liturgical efforts. And the bishops' conferences across the world were very helpful um, with the congregations in Rome to try to get the church moving forward with the translations and the new liturgical books that were being given. Differences in style between Bishop Tracy and Bishop Sullivan existed some of which brought dissension and strife to our new diocese. Difficulties were present as the vision Bishop Tracy had for the diocese was given less emphasis. Parishes and small groups of priests working together developed programs to keep a spirit of openness and growth alive in our new diocese. There were many struggles in the diocese, particularly in the period of um, our second bishop, uh, Bishop Joseph Sullivan, and uh, the time when priests kind of moved from a diocesan spirit of involvement of parishes together into kind of their own parish setting. And uh, 
things, uh, I think, began to deteriorate in terms of the visionary uh, diocesan connection and lay leadership, but there still were strong areas on the parish level, and the priest did remain uh, strong together. Part of the uh, retrenching to parishes develop programs like the Religious Studies Institute, which reconnected lay leadership with um, the, um, the minor seminary and professors from there uh, in developing uh, religious education for laity and degree work for laity in our diocese. So that was a real struggle, but uh, again, I think it brought out some of the best in terms of lay leadership as well as priestly leadership in our diocese. At that particular period, too, a number of priests left active ministry. Uh, it was uh, a time when um, there was a great, you know, change in the nature of the priesthood in the church generally and in our diocese. But there was again that, that continuing spirit of, you know, real sorrow that these guys left, of wanting to keep in touch with them. There was for many years. Uh, even an ex-priest group that met with um, Bishop Ott and would come together to uh, kind of continue a spirit of the diocese that we have been able to tap that continuing leadership in our diocese and to overcome some of the struggles. Bishop Sullivan was uh, the bishop who accepted me uh, as, a, as a seminarian for the diocese. The one thing that he said to me that has really impressed me and stayed with me even to this day was right before I went to the seminary, he met with me and he said, I know that as a Vietnamese, you probably will encounter some prejudices but I want you to know that I am here to support you, and if you ever run into those, let me know, and I will take care of them. Now, that meant a lot to me as someone who is new here. What he said to me was very comforting, knowing that uh, the bishop was sensitive to that issue and uh, wanted me to know that he would do whatever he could to, to help me. Bishop Sullivan contrary to Bishop Tracy, began to send the seminarians to Europe for their theological study. And so for a decade of priest training, began to give us a group of people who had degrees, graduate degrees and postgraduate degrees in uh, moral theology, in uh, dogmatic theology, um, and began to uh, bring back to the diocese sort of a different level. And uh, while that may have been a difficulty, it was a blessing and still is a blessing to our diocese. The combination, I think, strengthened the diocese that we had. A greater unification of the priest a greater strengthening of the fraternity uh, within the priests who worked in the diocese during that time. Um, uh, that our creativity was tapped and used uh, by local parishes, creativity that might have been left untouched and unfound. The way that one priest puts it, uh, Father Henry Bavisseur, is the following. He says that in raising Cain, if it does not rain, and you have sort of a drought at the time that the cane needs water, what the cane does is it sinks its roots deeper and deeper into the soil looking for water. And when the rain comes, the cane has such deep roots that the sprouting up is almost miraculous. And in a sense, that's what happened. During the uh, time of Bishop Sullivan, our roots sank deep. 
Vatican II brought many changes which continue to trickle down. Training in the reforms and their implications were necessary for all Catholic persons. Communicating the message of Vatican II to the students in local colleges had been a concern of Bishop Tracy. He had invited the Claritians, in order that included theologians, to minister to the Catholic students at LSU. Various implementations of the new approach to theology brought about by the Second Vatican Council were attempted, not, however, without controversy. Under um, Bishop Tracy, uh, the thinking concerning LSU was uh, that we needed to teach Vatican II not only uh, in our schools, in our, uh, to our adult laity out in the parishes, but we also needed to teach it on a university level. And he, he didn't have, prepa have prepared a priest, you know, right away to do that because most of us priests were trained to simply be pastors in parishes, uh, not theologians. And so he brought in a religious order, the Claritians, who had theologians whom he thought could better address the university community. Oddly enough, the ones who, who lasted were the more pastoral ones. <laughs> And the ones who were here for a year or two and gone uh, were the academicians that they sent down from Chicago. Bishop Sullivan was not at all happy. He didn't like the Claritians trying new things with the students. The Claritians were dismissed uh, after a time, and it caused a lot of uh, consternation, particularly among the all the Catholic community, adult community, uh, of professors and other people who worked for LS, LSU, as, as well as uh, a lot of people in the parishes who had children at LSU. And uh, Bishop Sullivan tried to settle the dust, <laughs> uh, first of all, by, by bringing in another religious order that was, had a reputation for being uh, retrogressive instead of progressive. And that, there was a big explosion about that, and even the other bishops of Louisiana counseled him, no, you know, let's not do that. And so he compromised by having a priest, actually from the Diocese of Lafayette, be pastor and had two of two assistant pastors from the diocese there and it it things sort of quieted down we'll take a short break and when we return we'll learn about evangelization and social responsibility in the 1970s roots of faith the History of the Diocese of Baton Rouge, written by Lee Loomis and Renee Richard, former archivists of the Diocese of Baton Rouge and original hosts of Roots of Faith. This beautiful coffee table book explores the history of the Catholic faith communities in the Baton Rouge area from the 1700s to the present day diocese. With more than 150 pages of history, early photographs of area churches and present day Catholic life, you'll discover the rich heritage and culture, not only of the diocese, but the individual unique parishes that contribute to its fabric. To reserve your copy of Roots of Faith, the history of the Diocese of Baton Rouge, please contact your parish church to obtain more information on how to place an order. New challenges for Catholics were realized. 
as lay people took on more and more of their baptismal obligations for faith sharing and social responsibility. The word evangelization wasn't used uh, 20 or 30 years ago and if somebody said the word evangelization I think a lot of us thought of someone standing on the corner beating a drum or they thought about somebody going door to door. But the, the Pope in 1975, uh, Pope Paul VI issued an encyclical calling evangelization the central role of the church. And what he did was to explain that evangelization meant, first of all, deepening the faith of those who are already members of the faith. Secondly, it meant trying to share the faith with others. And thirdly, it meant trying to change the society we live in to make it more Christ-like. So it's not just going out, secondly, to try to bring people into the church, but it's also trying to deepen the faith of the ones we have. So just to teach Catholics what evangelization means, those three roles, that's an important role. And to have the Pope say it's the central role of the church gets our attention. Then the U.S. bishops, about five years later, published a document applying evangelization to our United States experience because it will be different in every country. So the evangelization office in the diocese and evangelization committees in parishes try to work off those documents and see what can we do to deepen the faith of our existing Catholics, which might mean uh, parish missions, it might mean uh, more Bible studies, it might mean more courses on the history of the church and how it developed, that sort of thing. How can we reach out to others? Do we use the media to be able to publicize what we do? Do we make individual invitations to former Catholics to come back and reconnect with the church? Do we try to invite others into the right of Christian initiation of adults to inquire about being Catholics? Do we let them know that's available? And thirdly, how do we try to make a difference in our culture in the United States? So evangelization properly understood with the encouragement it's the central mission of a church means that those are the areas we ought to focus on. Beginning in 1970, the Diocese of Baton Rouge supported a mission in Santa Apollonia, Guatemala. As a seminarian in the 1960s, Father Eugene Ingalls, a Baton Rouge native, served summers at the Shrine of the Black Christ in Guatemala with Benedictine monks from St. Joseph Abbey in Covington. Father Ingalls felt called to continue his work in Guatemala, and Bishop Robert Tracy allowed the Diocese of Baton Rouge to undertake responsibility for a Guatemalan parish. Father Ingalls was the first priest assigned to Santa Apollonia since the 1700s. He served until 1975 and was later joined by Father David Stormy Vavasur and Father Victor Messina. During the decade that the Diocese of Baton Rouge was responsible for the mission, a medical and dental clinic opened to serve the local population. The dental clinic was especially appropriate because Santa Apollonia is the patron saint of dentists. The mission's primary goals included overcoming the suspicion which the native population had for foreigners, meeting the people's immediate material needs, and evangelizing and inviting the people to the Catholic faith. This program was carried out through the preparation of native catechists to teach in the local language, in the development of a religious order for men, and in the encouragement of religious vocations. Uh, Gene Ingalls was very interested. He studied Spanish. He was allowed to go down to Guatemala to uh, form a parish. And of course, we had a priest who was a classmate of mine from Guatemala who came up here, who was very anxious to have the diocese represented down in Guatemala. It was Father Carlos Sanchez. Uh, and his family were very prominent in Guatemala. The St. Apollonia Mission, I think it was near Solola. Father Ingalls developed it from ground up. <laughs> of course, when Bishop Sullivan went down there to consecrate the church, they had an earthquake the following week. 
destroy the church. Henry Vavasor's brother, Stormy Vavasor, went down there to be director after Father Ingalls, and uh, he rebuilt it. But the political situation in Guatemala was always very, very suspicious of the Catholic Church. And so the priests were uh, also, uh, American priests particularly, were looked down upon. I remember I was visiting Father Carlos Sanchez in Guatemala City one time where he was uh, a pastor of the uh, Blessed Sacrament Chapel and he would tell me at night time, now don't stand in the window, close the blinds because uh, even today it's dangerous. Father David Vavasour was one of the first ones there. Uh, unfortunately, he's deceased now. But he really uh, uh, got that uh, mission going and established. Father Gene Ingalls served some time there until uh, I think some of uh, the Guatemalan uh, officials and so forth forced them out. Again, for our diocese to recognize that their concerns were not just local, that the Universal Church had a claim on spreading the faith. And I think some of the parishes, some of the local parishes, I know St. Thomas more does, still supports uh, some of the foreign missions and kind of partnering with them. Vatican II reforms continued to be evident. It took time for the creative programs to be conceived, structured, and implemented. New programs continued to be developed as new ideas emerged to implement changes. Well, Bishop Sullivan had many positives, I think, that came from his administration. I think one of them is his, uh, his organizing of the catechesis into a, a more, uh, into a very logical class-by-class uh, -class presentation uh, and so forth. I think his slowing down some things that may have need to be slowed down in order that it might, that people might be able to catch up to it and integrate it, integrate the things. He was not a man of, of uh, doing things quickly. Uh, he had the, he, he thought things out. He was very, very much uh, meticulous in the way he acted. There were some movements that needed to be, I think, perhaps uh, brought into the more of the mainstream, and I think he did that. Uh, and not everybody agreed with him on that, but I think that was a positive that he did. And Vatican II uh, opened up the doors uh, of many theological uh, opinions and gave a lot of people the, uh, a great of hope of, of things that, that they could do, because some people took the spirit of Vatican II and ran maybe a little too far with it, you know, there were some things that maybe needed to be uh, brought back into a, a more moderate uh, position. I think Bishop Tr Sullivan was trying to do that. Church historians tell us that it takes at least 50 years for the church to digest an ecumenical council. Changes in liturgy and religious education that have come about since Vatican II uh, have been many and varied. I think one of the things that was very impressive for me as an educator at St. Joseph Academy with a one through 12 school when I started was to see the children's liturgy developed. Father Howard Hall was particularly helpful to us, but there were many priests who would come and we would have masses and those first through 12th graders all got to participate in liturgy. There were times when the Hootenanny masses maybe weren't the best thing we could have done. Um, on the other hand, uh, I have no regrets about the way we handle it, and I do believe that a lot of uh, the participation was because the students were so involved and they knew that the liturgy was about something important to them in their lives. So uh, religious education, obviously after Vatican II there were lots of changes in everything, and certainly in education, so it was the problem of what textbooks to use, or who's going to teach it, and. Uh, what level are you going to put what part of the curriculum? I mean, it was an upheaval. So there were many, many changes, and uh, you just said a lot of prayers and studied the best you could, and 
did what you could to make it really worthwhile for every student that came into your school. And then you were doing adult education because while you were teaching the students, you certainly were also having to keep parents informed who had been educated prior to Vatican II and who had lots of questions about what was going on. They may have been getting information through their parishes or they may not. They may have been going back to school themselves or they may not in many cases. And so uh, we, we kind of became adult educators as well while we were doing first through 12th grade. It was a very interesting time. I met in parochial school there at Sacred Heart, Sister Maria Rabelais, and that was kind of the beginnings of the Children's Liturgy Committee of the diocese. It was uh, through her asking me about possibly adapting, coming together with a group and adapting the liturgy, the adult liturgy, to more school level, children's level, that our committee began. This was like, oh, I would say pretty much a decade, a decade before Rome issued its little document on children's liturgy. So we really kind of were the pioneers with our committee, which I think indicates again the pioneer spirit of the diocese. And uh, so we formed the committee. We did a regular newsletter for a number of years. We did workshops, not only in the diocese, but throughout the, I would say, a section of the country. We published two books uh, on children's liturgy and children's reconciliation services. Uh, children celebrate and come be reconciled, both with Paulus Press uh, we did a little movie contrasting the sort of adult liturgy with creative children's liturgies. So it was uh, really a, a wonderful period which the diocese contributed to the adaptation of liturgy for youth. Before Vatican II, uh, the joke was that you paid, prayed, and obeyed. And the services that you would go to in church would be uh, novenas, uh, 40 hours devotions, things like that. The organizations that you would belong to in the church would be the Holy Name Society or the Altar Society. All really important roles, but assisting roles, not really directing roles. When Vatican Council II came, the emphasis was on our baptism not only gave us the dignity of being a minister, but empowered us to go do it. And so now the ministries in the church quite often are done by lay organizations. A parish council to help direct the, the parish and where it wants to go by signing out the wealth of all the people in the parish because they represent different areas. Youth ministry now not being done by the youngest priest of three who is in the rectory, who may have known nothing about youth ministry except he was young. Now with trained professionals who know and are trained to be youth ministers. Uh, religious education, so often before Vatican II, was done by sisters who belonged to religious communities and they did a good job with that. But now it's provided by, uh, by lay teachers who have gone through certification courses, often provided by our diocese. Our diocese does such a good job of that. And now they are very much involved in the education of the children so in so many ways, uh, the ministries are now part of what laity and clergy do together in a parish, work together on, and it's really wonderful to see a person step up and say, yes, I will participate in Mass, I will read, you know, I'll be a Eucharistic ministry. Yes, I'll take communion after Sunday liturgy to the homebound. Yes, we will put on services in a nursing home and you are able to do that. Yes, uh, we will continue to, to use our talents to serve so many others. In the early 70s, there were a group of lay people who said, can we have a, uh, a non-territorial community based on family liturgy and liturgical experience, family religious education, and so in the early 1970s, we began what was called Community in Christ Our Brother. Al Heine was a layperson who recently 
uh, is deceased, but who had a great formative uh, period with Community in Christ Our Brother, uh, some of the Claritian priests, and then finally after a year or two, uh, my own role as pastor, uh, director of the community. Uh, we met on Sundays at St. Joseph, uh, Joseph's Academy Cafeteria for a very lively liturgy centered around the families. We probably had 30 or 40 families um, that took part in the regular religious ed and the regular liturgical life of the community. Uh, extended families, uh, some of the uh, wonderful lay leaders in the diocese. We would have a very beautiful Easter liturgy at Audubon State Park in St. Francisville and uh, other opportunities like uh, a retreat for married couples, uh, which Joe and Melita Wise would conduct and, and so forth. So that lasted probably about 15 years uh, as sort of a, a non-parish experiment. Many priests embraced the new possibilities brought about by Vatican II. The Diocese of Baton Rouge underwent both positive experiences and growing pains. Bishop Sullivan's administration ended with his sudden death on September 4th, 1982. After Bishop Sullivan's death, the Vicar General of the Diocese, the late Monsignor Cage Garden, served as temporary administrator for almost seven months. Bishop Sullivan died, and uh, Bishop Ott came in, one of the first things he did was to send uh, Father Donald Blanchard and myself, you know, to LSU uh, as a deliberate statement that this is one of the most important ministries in our diocese, and we, we the priest of the Diocese of Baton Rouge, will uh, serve it. I think. In historical hindsight, it was a time in which too many people were not listening to each other. If things seemed to flourish under Bishop Tracy because there was collaboration and dialogue and working together on problems and common searching for solutions and approaches, at some point during Bishop Sullivan's time, that ceased. With nobody talking to each other, People's viewpoints grew rigid, uh, and very little progress was made for a number of years. Healing began in the Diocese of Baton Rouge under Bishop Stanley Joseph Ott, and many people realized how much strength and independence the diocese had gained. I think what happened under Bishop Sullivan, it, it made people think, you know, uh, under his administration, we had the opportunity to say, just where do I stand on this? Not to take things for granted. And so you ended up having uh, the Religious Studies Institute. Uh, you had other programs started uh, in parishes and around the diocese. We didn't wait for the diocese anymore to do it for us. You know, it made us more responsible. And, uh, and as things ceased to come from the diocese, um, people just picked up the ball and began to do it. And I think, you know, it's human nature. When we go through a period of trial um, in our personal lives, it might be sickness, it might be loss of a loved one, a lot of the times we come out of it so much stronger and so much more appreciative of, of who we are and what we have. I don't want to sound like I'm putting down Bishop Sullivan, but he had a viewpoint and it was his, you know. Bishop Tracy had his approach, his viewpoint, and a lot of Baton Rouge had been formed, obviously, under those Tracy years and, and felt the need to continue it. And so without saying, one was good, one was bad. This is where we were. 
We wanted to continue with it. The diocese did not seem to be supporting us in doing that. And so the parishes and many of the priests just picked up the ball and did it. And in a way, God may have been making us all the stronger for that because otherwise uh, we might have just sat back and just let the diocese keep doing it for us, you know? And so uh, I think the result of the Bishop Sullivan years, which was a much stronger uh, church that accepted much more personal responsibility for carrying on uh, the traditions that were ours. The Spirit lives on as we continue to learn and grow in the Diocese of Baton Rouge. Born in the Spirit of Faith uh, resonates so deeply because I really think we were born in the Spirit of Faith. Again, I think it was the Spirit that was certainly present hovering over us as we came to birth and that Spirit has stayed with us all the way through. I always think of one thing that has been a, a very important touchstone for me. I don't know where the words came from. I think they came from St. Benedict and I've used it before and the words are always we begin again. Always we begin again. In my mind, anniversaries like the 50th help us to remember always we begin again. So we can be happy for what has been. Uh, we can't be too distracted though from what we're doing now because we know always there's more coming. And in God's grace, always we begin again.